Hello everyone, welcome back to Case Acquaint. You found episode 4 in our I-95 corridor series. First up though, we have an update on the Kimberly Graves case. According to reports, Kimberly's body was found in Lori State Park, which is just west of Fort Collins, Colorado. Kimberly's death is being investigated as a homicide. A special thanks to all of you who spread the word about her disappearance. Our thoughts are with Kimberly's family as they now must surely want to know who hurt Kimberly and when justice will be served. For episode four, we've traveled a few miles up the interstate to the Rocky Mount, North Carolina region. Rocky Mount is a city, but it's also referred to as a large area that encompasses two neighboring counties, Nash and Edgecombe. I-95 travels straight up through Nash County, but it runs parallel and is super close to the Edgecombe County line. Rocky Mount has a unique history. It's the halfway point between New York and Florida, and early on in its development, its central location influenced its importance in the transportation industry. Serving as a major hub for stagecoach lines and railroads, it's natural that as automobile transportation grew, the Rocky Mount area became host to several I-95 exits, and several major state highways also intersect there. Rocky Mount, while it has its challenges with industry extinction, poverty, and crime, it's starting to see several large-scale projects in process to improve living standards for the residents of the Rocky Mount area. Today, our first subject and the main one for this episode has really stretched the resources of the law enforcement agencies over there, so much so that the local law enforcement agencies eventually had to request the help of the NCSBI, that means North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation. Because of that request and the SBI's acceptance of it, the Governor's Crime Commission awarded a grant to the SBI to bring in some retired special agents, law students, and other law enforcement officials to try to help close some of the unsolved homicides and missing person cases, of which there are many in this area. They've been going through these cases, trying to test any DNA, process other evidence, and lend support to the local agencies. The task force has been operating for about 10 years now, so it'd be great if they could someday make progress on any of these outstanding cases. So that's something for residents to feel hopeful about, especially families of those whose homicide deaths have not been solved, and on behalf of whom justice has not yet been served. For now, though, as usual, we're going to jump right into the details of some of these cases, ask some questions, and maybe we'll be able to update later with some answers on future episodes. There are a lot of victims in this story, and there are three concurrent timelines, so it's going to get pretty complicated. You'll hear when people disappeared, when their body was found, and you'll also hear dates associated with a suspected killer's life at the time. It probably won't be easy to keep everything straight, and we'll be posting a timeline on our website at caseacquaint.com. Hopefully it's accurate. We've not been able to get a hold of a timeline, so we need to create one ourselves. If you notice any mistakes on the timeline, please let us know. We'd appreciate it. Also, there are a few victims that may or may not be tied to the rest of the victims. We're still going to mention them because they are no less important. Anyway, if that didn't scare you off, let's get started on our story, which takes place in and around historic, mysterious Rocky Mount, North Carolina. In June 2003, the unsuspecting community of Rocky Mount was startled with the news that a 21-year-old mom, Denise Williams, who had been missing for a week, was found floating in Cokey Swamp off Clover Road. She was last seen getting into a dark brown vehicle. That story was briefly discussed, then promptly forgotten. Then in 2005, the brutalized body of Melody Lachey Wiggins a 29-year-old prostitute, was found on May 30th. She was placed in some woods near a field off Old Farm Road. She'd been stabbed, but what caused her death was blunt force trauma to the skull. 
Later, a woman named Alicia spoke to a reporter about the situation on the streets. She said that when she heard about Melody's body being found, she decided she was done, as she put it, jumping in and out of cars. She said, I need to live. I have five babies. June 25, 2006, a fisherman and his son found the nude body of Travis Harrison, 24 years old, a known crossdresser and prostitute. The body was found in a thicket off Virginia Avenue behind a park along the Tar River. A year later, in June of 2007, a Rocky Mount prostitute by the name of Joyce Renee Durham went missing. The small community of prostitutes talked with each other about the new dangers they were facing in order to support their drug habits. The next person to be discovered dead was Jackie Thorpe. Friends and family called her Nikki, 35 years old. Somebody put Nikki in a pile of trash behind a house on Seven Bridges Road, where the body was later found August 17, 2007. Nikki was reported missing in May of 2007 and her body was out there for three months before it was found. Then, on March 14th of 2008, another body was found by a farmer who was working on an electric fence on his property. He had smelled the familiar stench of rotting flesh and assumed it must have been a dead deer. But upon closer inspection, the farmer realized it was a human being. Someone had placed the body about 40 feet into the woods. It belonged to Ernestine Battle, 50 years old, another prostitute, while the cause of death could not be definitively established, police believed she was strangled. She was placed face down and was missing her underwear. Ernestine was reported missing in February of 2008, one month prior, after her family hadn't heard from her for two days. Did police look for Ernestine Battle when she was reported missing? So some of these family members of the dead victims and the missing victims started to talk to each other, and they talked to the media. At this point, a trend had developed. People would go missing. No one would look for them. People would turn up murdered. Nobody looked for the murderer. Some disappearances kind of fell through the cracks and for the time being were forgotten. The last time anyone claimed to have seen a woman by the name of Roberta Williams was around the time Ernestine's body was found, March of 2008. The 40-year-old prostitute was homeless, so she wasn't reported missing, but people knew her. She didn't really go on, you know, skiing trips to the Alps or whatever, so people knew something had happened to her. At this point, after Ernestine's body was found, the special task force that we spoke about earlier in the intro was formed. The local authorities asked for help from the SBI, and the SBI started helping the investigation. After the disappearance and or murder of at least seven people, this task force was officially formed. But the bodies kept turning up. A set of remains was found outside of town, but they weren't identified. So they sent them off for testing. February 22, 2009, 28-year-old Tara Nicholson was reported missing. We don't know when she was last seen, but that was when Tara was reported missing. On March 7th, some hunters out riding their ATVs off Marriott Road found Tara Nicholson's mostly nude body, which was in the early stages of decomposition, and which hadn't yet been totally ravaged all that much by animals. They were able to establish a cause of death for Tara, which was strangulation. Also, there is evidence that Tara had been dragged to the spot at which she was found. The autopsy report said that a sexual assault kit was used, which implies they were able to swab for foreign substances in or on Tara's body. People had been asking questions. Up to this point, there had already been dozens of news articles written about the deaths and disappearances in Rocky Mount. Everybody knew there was a task force, but it didn't seem like they accomplished anything. The authorities were asked regularly if they had suspects, if they had any ideas and the authorities replied with not much of anything. They didn't make any arrests. They didn't even hint at a person of interest. But then something happened. First, on April 25, 2009, and you're going to want to remember this date, a state trooper observed a guy named Antoine Maurice Pittman asleep in his car. The car was parked in a ditch on Seven Bridges Road. The trooper made contact with Pittman, 
He knew something wasn't right with this guy. He had mud on his boots and his pants were unzipped. He ended up getting arrested for DUI and for driving with a revoked license. Now, people who have had contact with Pittman before all this came out have said that he was a crack user just like the prostitutes that were dumped in that area. Pittman, unbeknownst to the families of the victims, was on the task force's radar. They had an idea he was doing something over there. And don't forget, these victims were dumped mostly in the same area, and that area was where Pittman was found asleep in his car. They didn't find anybody else out there sleeping in their car, but just because somebody's asleep in his car with his pants unzipped and mud on his boots on a country road that a bunch of women's bodies have been dumped around, that doesn't make someone a serial killer. He was out of jail before the next body was found. That next body was Jarnice Latanya Hargrove, who went by the name Sunshine. On June 29th of 2009, So two months later, a farm laborer found the 31-year-old's body behind an old house that had gone up in flames at one point and was known as a gathering place for drug use and what have you. She'd been reported missing a month prior. And actually, the night Pittman was arrested for DWI on the 25th of April, that was the last day Hargrove was ever seen alive. As it turned out, Hargrove's body was found just 200 yards from where he was parked, asleep. This was being put together as the body was collected and in process of being identified. But of course, as these realizations came out, the investigators weren't telling the public or the families what they were doing. So everybody thought they were still trying to ignore these victims. And in fact, Jarnice Hargrove's family said, that they believed investigators were sweeping the women under the rug and nobody seemed to care. Jarnice's autopsy would prove to be inconclusive because her body was just out there in the elements and with the animals too long, especially with it being summertime in sultry, humid, hot North Carolina. That's unfortunate because Antoine Maurice Pittman had been a person of interest for some time, but without evidence, There wasn't much anybody could do with him. The media hounded the sheriff, but all he could say was that on one hand he wanted to satisfy the citizens and let them know they're doing all they could in his estimation. But on the other hand, they also couldn't just take a case to the district attorney without hard evidence. I'm not trying to criticize, but I don't think police should need to be reminded that it's difficult to get hard evidence if you're just stumbling on all the evidence too late for it to yield good, usable data. On February 13, 2009, a prison work crew found the remains of Elizabeth Jane Smallwood. Her cause of death was never established, but they did say She had been dead for between six months and a year, and her body was found within one mile of Travis Harrison, the 24-year-old crossdresser, from three years prior in 2006. Interesting to note that at one point, Antoine Pittman, who moved around a lot, lived right around the corner from where Elizabeth Smallwood's remains were found. By September of 2009, investigators had gathered enough evidence to charge Pittman with the murder of Tara Nicholson, who you'll remember had been found on March 7, 2009. We'll talk about that evidence in a few minutes, but first, we have more bodies turning up. Just because Pittman was arrested, that doesn't mean bodies stopped turning up. And frankly, investigators wanted more evidence than they actually had. In 2010, on March 5th, authorities were out looking for a missing teenager when they stumbled on the body of Christine Marie Boone. 43 years old when she was last seen in 2006. Christine's family reported her missing in 2007, and that was the end of that until somebody stumbled on her decomposed remains. Christine's remains were found in a wooded area behind a mobile home that one Antoine Pittman used to live in around the time Christine went missing. Christine's sister Minnie said that knowing Christine was dead was a shock and, and that of course she was devastated. When asked if the news brought closure, she responded, It has brought some closure, but I'm waiting for justice. 
Christine had three children and seven grandchildren. The discovery of Christine's body gave investigators hope that they might find some good evidence tying Pittman to more deaths than Tara Nicholson's. And so a week after Christine's body was found, on March 11th of 2010, they got a search warrant for Pittman's former residence, the one Christine had been found behind. And according to the search warrant, they seemed to believe they might find evidence connecting Pittman not only to Christine, but also to the murders of Nikki Thorpe, Ernestine Battle, Tara Nicholson, and Jarnice Hargrove. Again, we don't know what, if anything, they found during that search. But don't forget, this was a trailer house he hadn't lived in for five years. At this point in the story, you might start to feel kind of sorry for the authorities. The only evidence they seem to ever get is what somebody stumbles across. They never seem to find anything when they're out looking. Maybe they should have gone out looking when people were reported missing. Maybe then they would have found something they could have used. But anyway, on March 27th of 2010, the body of Roberta Williams, age 40, was found by another person who was just out riding their ATV. That discovery prompted the task force to plan a very large-scale search. They planned a search for Tuesday, August 24th. They brought the National Guard back out, along with cadaver dogs, cavalry officers, volunteer firefighters, SBI, and FBI investigators. And they combed the Seven Bridges Road area. What were they looking for? Well, at this point, they were looking for evidence related to the remains they had already found, and they were also looking for the people who were still missing. Unfortunately, again, we don't know what they found, if anything, and there are no reports that more remains were found on that day. Also in August of 2010, a memorial was organized to remember the people who had thus far been found and also to pray for those still missing. Edgecombe County Sheriff James Knight attended and spoke briefly, assuring the attendees, which included family and friends of the missing and dead, that he did care about their family members and they are investigating, even though he couldn't discuss details of the investigations. Then in January of 2011, somebody found the remains of 37-year-old Yolanda Lancaster, who's referred to by those who knew her as Snap. She was last seen on February 5th of 2009 and reported missing in March of that year. Even back in 2009, Lancaster's family was begging authorities to look for Yolanda. And even back then, in 2009, Lancaster's young daughter, told a TV news team that she couldn't sleep some nights from wondering what might have happened to her mom. She said, I'll be thinking, is she all right? Is she hurt? Lancaster's mom said, Every day, every minute, every hour, I'm worried. It's constant on my mind, and there ain't nothing I can do. Ain't nothing I can do. These are the feelings of powerlessness that families all have to experience when a family member is missing. And every time another body turns up being reported on the news, they wonder if it's their loved one. The remains of these women were all found within a 10-mile radius of one another. Also, Pittman never lived more than three and a half miles from where any one of these people were dumped. He moved around a lot, and all of these locations he had either lived or worked nearby. So briefly, we're going to talk about the criminal exploits of one Antoine Pittman, who, according to his mom, was a victim of the cops needing somebody to pin this on. For reference, if you don't want a murder to get pinned on you, don't act like Antoine Pittman. In 1994, at the age of 16, Pittman was charged with attempted first-degree rape of a two-year-old girl. He ended up with a sweet deal on that charge. He pleaded guilty to taking indecent liberties with a minor. For that, he had to go to a youth boot camp program because, you know, that's how you teach rapists not to rape people anymore. I know I'm being sarcastic. I don't mean to make light of that charge, but to me... It really crystallizes the lack of common sense the court system uses when sentencing predators. Anyway, young Pittman was booted out of the boot camp program for threatening the other kids. So they decided to go ahead and put him on probation, which he promptly violated. And finally, he ended up spending 15 months in prison. 
When Pittman was released in 1997, he threw his criminal career into overdrive and immediately began accruing arrests and convictions for things like assault and larceny. In 2004, he was arrested for assaulting his girlfriend, but the girlfriend wouldn't testify against him, so those charges were dropped. 2007, he was picked up for soliciting the services of a prostitute in the same area where all these subsequent prostitute victims worked. The officer who arrested him was deployed to Iraq, so those charges were also dropped. Pretty lucky guy, this Pittman. So remember that arrest in April of 2009 that I said, remember this date? When Pittman was released and then Jarnice Hargrove's body was found soon thereafter in June of 2009, well, around that same time, the DNA results from Tara Nicholson's sexual assault forensic kit came back. And that DNA belonged to none other than Antoine Pittman. And so, authorities didn't want to screw this up. They arrested him for failing to register as a sex offender with his last known address. And while he was still in jail for that, then he was charged with Tara's murder. Out of all of these victims dead and missing, the only body which has ever been found in time to offer up DNA was Tara's. The trial, I'm not sure how much we need to get into that. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit. Pittman maintained his innocence. His family supported that claim of innocence. He said he picked Nicholson up for paid sex, and then he dropped her off. End of story. He also said Nicholson was the only prostitute he'd ever had sex with. It didn't matter that two prostitutes came forward and testified against him, stating that he attacked them. And one prostitute spoke with the media about her encounter with Pittman, and it was on that lonely stretch of road that Pittman attacked her inside his car, and she said she fought for her life. She was able to get out of the car, run and hide, and after him not being able to find her, she says Pittman got back in the car and left. She found a ride back to town with some migrant farm workers. None of that mattered to the defense because these were prostitutes, they were just liars, and they had no credibility. Even though a bunch of liars got up on the stand and testified against Pittman, on the afternoon of Thursday, September 29, 2011, our 33-year-old registered sex offender and newly convicted first-degree murderer cried, lamenting his impending imprisonment and sentence of life without possibility of parole for the brutal murder of Tara Nicholson. I want to run through all the similarities between these victims. Every victim identified as a female. Travis was cross-dressing, and that's all we know. But as a cross-dresser, Travis was identifying as female and as a prostitute. Every victim had a history of prostitution and drug addiction. Finally, all these victims were African American. These are people who are vulnerable. All killers know that. And that's why they're easy targets if the killer doesn't want to get caught. If Tara's body hadn't been found so soon after being dumped, and if it hadn't been wintertime, who knows how long this would have continued to go on. People have been criticizing the police for years. I know we've made fun of them just a little bit, maybe portrayed them as kind of keystone cops, but they have to do better. When people go missing, you don't dismiss their families by saying, people walk away from their lives all the time. But you also can't hold cops totally responsible for this either. We need to change laws. If law enforcement is compelled by law to investigate a missing adult, they will do it. If there's nothing telling them they have to, they aren't going to unless there's another factor involved. Even with lots of media attention, they still don't have to do anything. Families have to hire their own private investigators who are regularly shut out so they just run into roadblocks when dealing with police. This makes absolutely no sense. Still missing is Joyce Renee Durham, 46 at the time of her disappearance. She was last seen on Harper Street the afternoon of June 17th of 2007. On that day, Joyce was 5 foot 2, about 118 pounds, black hair, brown eyes, African American. You'll find a picture of her on our website, casequaint.com. 
While police may no longer be actively looking for the killer of these women, a $20,000 reward is offered to anyone with a tip leading to an arrest in the deaths. Anyone with information about these cases is asked to call Twin County Crime Stoppers at 252-977-1111. Also, before we say goodbye, we want to let you know that there are more missing people, a lot more missing people, in the general area. Here are details about three of those people. Some of you may have noticed that Christine Boone's body was found while authorities were searching for a missing teen. That teenager was Jalisa Chantel Reynolds, who disappeared on February 22, 2010, after being last seen at the Scotland Neck Memorial Library. Reynolds is still missing to this day. The authorities have a suspect, but the suspect has denied any involvement. Jalisa Chantel Reynolds is African American, black hair, brown eyes, 5 foot 2, 230 pounds. You'll also find her picture on our website, casequaint.com. If you have any information, contact Halifax County Sheriff's Office, 252 583 8201. Shonda Stansbury has been missing since December 7th of 2006. That was the last confirmed sighting of Shonda. But another sighting of Shonda must have been frightening for her family to hear about. A woman called 911 at around 11.44 p.m. on December 14th of 2006. The woman said she had seen Shonda at the intersection of Highway 158 and Highway 903 running from behind a store called Information Grocery, and she was being chased by two black males. She was nude. Despite massive searches, Shonda was never seen again. At the time of her disappearance, Shonda was 24 years old. She was 5 feet 5 inches tall and weighs around 120 pounds. She has brown hair, blue eyes, a tattoo of a heart with a ribbon through it and the name Brianna on her right calf, and a tattoo of a rose with the name Kobe on her left breast. She has a birthmark across her lower mid-back. Anyone with information on her whereabouts is encouraged to call the police department at 533-2810 or Halifax County Crime Stoppers at 583-4444. On February 17th of 2017, Governor Ray Cooper initiated a $5,000 reward for information that would lead to the conviction of anyone responsible for Shonda's disappearance. The family also appears to be offering $2,000. Amy Wells Bridgman went missing from Weldon, North Carolina on June 24th, 2013. The FBI reports that Amy might have gotten into a long-haul trucker's rig. Amy was 42 when she disappeared in 2014. She has brown hair, but has been known to dye her hair black. She's 5 foot 2 and weighs 180 pounds. She has several tattoos. On her neck are the words, True Slave, and Pain is Beauty. On her left shoulder, a zombie. On her right shoulder, a woman tied up. On her back, a cherry tree. If you have any information to share about Amy Wells Bridgman, please call the Halifax County Sheriff's Office at 252-583-8201. Finally, it's worth mentioning that in March of 2017, some skeletonized human remains were found by a public works employee in the town of Roanoke Rapids behind an abandoned building that had previously been a beauty shop called Mary's Glamour Lounge, which is off Highway 158 near Spring Street and Carter Street at East Littleton Road. They sent the remains to the East Carolina University Anthropology Department and no information has been returned as of this date. Now, as usual, you can find more information on the subjects discussed in this episode by visiting our website at caseacquaint.com. Join the discussion group on our Facebook page. We would be interested in knowing what you think about the cases you've heard about today. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk again soon.